Some interesting news that's out there in the world of football. Let's dive into it a little bit. Um, I, I thought this was intriguing. They had an owner's meeting yesterday in the NFL and voted on a couple of different rules that uh, could be significant down the line. The first one, and I think by far the most significant for this season, is the NFL has now voted if they have to cancel any games, any games at all. We're halfway through. So far, no games have been canceled. They are going to do away with the bye uh, for the number one overall seed in the NFC and the AFC, and they are instead going to expand the playoffs to eight teams in the AFC, eight teams in the NFC, and everyone would have to play in the opening weekend. So instead of only having one bye this year, which is what they have uh, agreed on because they've expanded the playoffs to seven teams in the AFC and seven teams in the NFC, they would have no buys at all. So this is kind of an intriguing move to me because it could be significant down the stretch. Yes, you would still get to play at home if you are the Pittsburgh Steelers or if you are the New Orleans Saints, the two teams that if the season ended today would be the number one seeds in the AFC and the NFC. But how much of a home field advantage do you actually have when either there are no fans present or there are a relatively small number of fans present? But I think it's an interesting question uh, to, uh, to contemplate. The other uh, rule that they have uh, voted on, and I don't think this is a, uh, I don't think this is a very uh, well thought out or intelligent policy, is if you have a minority coach that is hired away by someone else, then the team with the minority coach that is hired away gets a compensatory draft pick. The idea behind it is to encourage teams to develop minority coaching candidates, but couldn't this work against the idea of hiring away a coach? Because if you're trying to catch a team, why would you hire away their coach when you are then rewarding them with a third-round pick, which is fairly valuable? I'll give you an example. Right now, you have a situation where Eric Bieniemy may well become a head coach in the NFL, right? He is uh, the offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs. It's a very good chance that somebody is going to hire him away from the Chiefs this offseason to take over their job. Probably the favorite, I would say, to do so may well be the Houston Texans. But the Houston Texans are trying to catch the Kansas City Chiefs In the AFC, they want to be able to become better than the Chiefs, given the fact the Chiefs are the best team, arguably, in the NFL right now. Certainly, they're the favorite to repeat as Super Bowl champs. Well, if the Houston Texans hire away Eric Bieniemy, they actually give the Chiefs an advantage even more against them because the Chiefs then get one year a third-round pick and potentially a third-round pick the next year. That seems like a disincentive to me to the team like the Houston Texans to hire away a coach from the Kansas City Chiefs. Also, it creates opposite incentives in my mind. You should, I believe, incentivize people to hire the best possible coaches and players for the reason that the NFL meritocracy works Because if you have the best players and coaches, you win more football games. And frankly, if there are some teams that are racist and they're not hiring the best players or coaches because race is influencing their decision-making in a negative way, then the market should reward the less racist teams because they would get better value on players right, or coaches. Let me give you an example. If you've watched the Patriots over the years, they have had, it's become kind of a a funny joke, they've had a lot of white wide receivers, right? I mean, that has become a meme on the the internet. You see Bill Belichick holding those uh, those, uh, binoculars, and every time like a white guy runs a fast 40, somebody will put up that picture of Bill Belichick holding the binoculars and watching 
from the NFL Combine, right? Why did Bill Belichick do that? Because I believe Bill Belichick noted a market inefficiency. He recognized that guys like Julian Edelman were undervalued relative to their ability to perform at the NFL level. So he could invest less money in a white wide receiver than he might have to in a wide receiver who was black. In other words, there was a disbelief that white wide receivers could get the job done that allowed Belichick to exploit a market inefficiency, whether it was Wes Welker, whether it was Julian Edelman, whatever that decision was, I think if we had Bill Belichick on, he would say, yeah, we found that we had a competitive disadvantage, a competitive advantage because white wide receivers were comparatively undervalued, so we could pay less money to them, they could do the job at a lower cost, and that allowed us to get a competitive advantage. Well, if it's true that minority head coaches and assistant coaches are being undervalued, then you should be able to exploit the market racism of that position. And so your own lack of racism would lead to more victories. In other words, I believe markets ultimately get things right when there are highly competitive industries involved. Does that make sense to people out there? Rather than try to give perverse incentives, which may blow up against you, again, think about my example of the Houston Texans maybe being interested in Eric Bieniemy. but if I'm sitting there and I'm the owner of the Texans, I'm like, man, I don't want to give away uh, extra draft picks to the team that we're trying to catch. Maybe we should go hire somebody else who we think could help us and not give an advantage to the Kansas City Chiefs in the process. So market-based solutions to me in highly competitive fields work better. Undervalued assets that then perform at a higher rate allow there to be opportunities to unlock value better than trying to put in ham-handed incentives. So anyway, those are two big moves that the NFL has made. I think the one about, I'm going to bring in the crew, see what they think about these. But to me, the eight teams in the uh, in the playoffs business is really kind of fascinating because it could lead to teams saying, well, we don't really care about a home field advantage this year. Let's rest our best players and know that we're going to have to win three playoff games no matter what. That's a big difference in terms of the way that the playoffs could look in the NFL this year compared to in past seasons. And what do you think about my argument? I understand the NFL's goal here, but I also think it's a uh, well-intentioned plan that is likely to blow up given the circumstances that I just laid out. Danny G, what do you think about both of these potential changes in the NFL? Yeah, the 8 and 8 makes a lot of sense to me, so there's no issue with that. As far as being a minority head coach, I don't think that I would want to feel like draft picks were involved and that's why my name was in yeah. the mix. It would arguably it's insulting cuz it makes yes. it look like you're not good enough to get the job without somebody having to be given something else to take you. Exactly right. And I don't know if you remember this, but a few months ago when this topic was on our show, we had a coach call up, uh, I forget what from what state, but he was a minority head coach in, in uh, high school. Yeah. And he was telling you that he felt like where we really needed to focus in on this issue was at the high school and college level. Yeah. And I think, honestly, that's a good point. The, the focus should be on the introduction at the level of beginning to become a head coach, right? And, and that was uh, maybe not stated as uh, succinctly or eloquently as it could have been where people enter into the idea to become a coach. Because wh- how do you become a head coach in the NFL? Mostly by being an offensive or defensive coordinator. If you are not an offensive or defensive coordinator, it's hard to become a head coach. Well, how do you become an offensive or defensive coordinator? At the age of about 22 years old, you take a job at the lowest rung of coaching in the NFL and then or college And then you have to slowly work your way up. In other words, the NFL promotes from within, like many jobs, 
and you have to put in probably, what, 15 years at least. It's relatively rare that somebody becomes a head coach in the NFL before 36 or 37 years old, right? So most of the guys who are getting head coaching jobs in the NFL are working in the NFL for 12, 13, 14, 15 years before they become head coaches at the absolute earliest. And a lot of times guys have to work into their 40s or even into their uh, almost 50 years old to get a head coaching job. You have to work your way up over time. Who are the people that are entering the profession to become coaches? That to me is where you need to look to determine what the end result is. In other words, what are the percentages of people at the age of 22 who want to be coaches look like? Uh, There are a lot, it seems to me, of Sean McVay's of the world, people who are not particularly talented as athletes and recognize that they have no NFL future. So at some point, they pivot their football dreams from, I want to be a player to, I want to be a coach. And if you start at 22 years old or even 21 or 20 years old on internships, like a lot of these guys do, then you're advantaged in terms of one day being able to become a head coach. What do you think about both of these uh, ideas that the NFL voted on, Dub? Yeah, I agree with Danny G um, on the coaching thing because, I mean, I think if that was me, it would seem almost like an insult. I, I agree with that. It's like, did you hire me because of you want me as your coach or did you hire me because of all these incentives that are involved? Uh, the eighth game playoff, I think it's a pretty much a no-brainer, especially if games get canceled. It, to me, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah. But in terms of the home field advantage – I guess it is a slight disadvantage for teams that are, you know, eyeing that playoff by because obviously that would not be uh, given if this were to come true. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, home field advantage would now shift from fans. And by the way, a big part of the home field advantage is your influence of officials. So people like to claim that officiating is completely 100% unbiased, at least if they're in the officiating ranks. But the number of screaming fans seems to influence things in a positive direction for the home team. And the same thing happened uh, with the NBA where the home field advantage, home court advantage kind of disappeared without fans present. And in the NFL, that's one of the major changes that has occurred is there's almost no difference in who's winning a game in the NFL now based on who's playing at home or away. And I think a big part of that is, as somebody who has been to three NFL games so far this year, when there's ten or 11,000 people in the stands, there's no real influence from the crowd at all because there just aren't enough people there. And so the, uh, the subconscious influence upon officials who would overwhelmingly typically favor the home team doesn't exist on the same level, such that I think home field advantage in the NFL playoffs this year is much more likely to be of the nature of, hey, Green Bay, it's freaking cold. It's going to be really difficult for some teams to make that travel trip to Green Bay and be able to play at a high level because of the uh, environment there. Or let's say if you are the New Orleans Saints, getting to play in the Dome, not necessarily because of the crowd that will be normally be loud in New Orleans in the Superdome, but just being able to play indoors on turf when you're a team that has been built in that way, those would be, to me, the big home field advantages, the the, the outdoor environment or the indoor env- environment that your team has been crafted to be able to, uh, to take part in. What about you, uh, Eddie? What do you think about this uh, expanded playoff field? You're a Steelers fan. Does it seem fair to you that the Steelers, who are 8-0 for the first time, I believe, in their history – might actually not end up with any advantage really in terms of less games based on the number one seed and that they don't even know what the what that situation is going to be even halfway through the season. And what do you think about this change to encourage the minority coaching hires? Well, I'll start with the, the last one first. I'm just fundamentally against any kind of incentives to hire coaches or anyone else based on anything other than the qualities that they have to be yeah. a good head coach. It's funny, I was just reading an article just a second ago about Raheem Morris, who's now the interim head coach in Atlanta, and how he should get a second chance because it didn't work out in Tampa, but he's doing a good job in Atlanta now. And look, if they want to hire him, I don't have a problem with it. But it's funny, if that were an article about Dan Quinn being talked about for another job, then there would be you know an outcry of how you know this guy's getting a second chance and he had his opportunity and he blew it yeah and yet Raheem Morris is deserving of a second chance and by the way Dan Quinn coach. way more successful than Raheem Morris 
Correct. Right? I mean, Dan Quinn, 28-3. I hate to bring it up, Atlanta Falcon fans, but he was good enough to get his team to the Super Bowl. Absolutely. So, as far as the Steelers, look, it's hard for me to take the personal feelings out of the situation, but I will say this, and and what you brought up earlier, if the Steelers happen to be undefeated, which I don't think they will be, late in the year, and they're going to have to play a first-round game, I'm 100% in favor of them resting players. Yeah and saying, who cares about this undefeated record? It's about the playoffs. It's about trying to win a Super Bowl. I think it even is possible that teams could be resting players without even worrying about the idea. If, if eight teams are going to make the playoffs, and if you know that you have to win three playoff games to make the Super Bowl, no matter what, I think there are a lot of teams out there that may say, hey, especially given that this is a strange year with COVID and everything else, they may say we just really don't care about whether we're going to have home field, you know, especially if you're thinking about home field in the AFC championship game, right? Maybe it matters to the Steelers in a big way, whether they got to play in Pittsburgh or they got to play in Kansas City. I can see how that could matter because right now the number one seed would be the Steelers and the two seed would be the Chiefs. But I don't know that odds makers would even really adjust at this point, the overall uh, line in this game because having ten or 11,000 fans present doesn't really impact things one way or the other. So I could see a lot of teams making the decision to sit out their, their players in a way that usually never happens because, you know, without a bye week and, uh, and without any real incentive in the grand scheme of things to play less games, I don't know why you wouldn't rest some of your players in the final couple of weeks of the season if you knew you had to play three straight weeks regardless. I, I think that's worth paying attention to. I think that's a big change. What about you, uh, Roberto? How would you assess these two NFL uh, pr- uh, proposed rule changes they just voted on? Yeah, I agree with you that uh, the f- home field advantage in the playoffs is going to be, you know, because cause, cause of the weather or, you know, the, the dome environment. And as a minority on this show, Clay, I wasn't hired because you or Ben Maller got a bonus check for hiring me. I was I was hired for yeah. my expertise and because I was I was the best candidate for this job. So yeah, I, I don't I don't agree with that. With yeah, that and it's rule. interesting. You guys who were out in California, this was just a ballot measure, right? And you know, people talk about how wildly left wing the state of California is. Didn't you guys just have a ballot measure to vote on whether affirmative action should uh, should exist for? I think it was college admissions or whatever else yeah, was it. Like that. Yeah, I voted no on that. Yeah, I mean, but it pa- it, it didn't pass, right? Like, and it got beaten pretty soundly in the state of California. Yeah. I, th- I think it was, right? I mean, I, I obviously don't vote on uh, in the California, but you guys would know better than me. Didn't it lose like 56 to 44, even in the state of California, the idea of my, you know, minority benefit based on your race as to whether you get admitted into colleges at a different rate? Yeah, you're right. Um, and so even in California, which has a reputation, certainly well-deserved in many ways of being a very left-wing state, an NFL-like policy that was voted on was crushed in the state of California as to whether or not affirmative action should exist in college admissions. And if the state of California is rejecting that, and uh, th- then I think there's probably a huge percentage of people who are sports fans across the nation who feel like the NFL, and by the way, of all different races, who feel like the NFL idea of we're going to give draft pick benefits yeah, that's dumb. Is, is just a broken po- And what do you guys think about my idea here? Like, if you're the Texans and you want to hire Eric Bieniemy, do you want to give an advantage to the team that you're trying to catch in the Kansas City Chiefs? I mean, a third-round pick is a pretty high-level pick. You could get a difference maker in the third round that makes it more difficult for the Houston Texans to catch the Kansas City Chiefs. To me, this could be a perverse disincentive if you're trying to catch the team. The Chiefs and the Texans a perfect example right now. The Chiefs are a lot better than the Texans. If the Texans hire Eric Bieniemy, they're hoping to catch the Chiefs. Well, perversely, you're giving the Chiefs another leg up if the Texans decide to hire Eric Bieniemy and the Chiefs get a couple of extra third round picks and one of those guys ends up being a huge stud that ends up beating Eric Bieniemy and the Texans in a game. Yeah, and, and uh Eric Bieniemy may be a, a great candidate and he may may as well probably going to be a good coach but since uh Andy Reid is the one that calls all the plays there yeah. with Kansas City I'm a little weary about that. Yeah, I mean I I think there are all different sorts of reasons why guys do or do not get jobs but my my point circling back around would be 
if there is a market inefficiency based on racism, why wouldn't you be the team that was not racist and took advantage of the other racism in the NFL and that led to your team having more success than they otherwise would? That, to me, seems like the incentive that should exist. The NFL, whether you uh, are a huge fan or not, is about winning games, and teams will do whatever it takes to win games to find the best players, to find the best coaches. If you can find an inefficiency in the market, and that's what I was using an example, I think there was an inefficiency in the market at wide, white, white wide receivers that Bill Belichick exploited. He was able to get wide receivers that were otherwise going to be overlooked and didn't cost very much money, like Wes Welker and Julian Edelman, and turn them into, in the case of Edelman, maybe a Hall of Famer when nobody else would see that opportunity or that advantage. I think it's uh, I think it's pretty intriguing to think about. And Dub, you were just running through some third round picks. I mean, this is could this could be a difference maker for a franchise for a long time. Who you got uh, th- that you've looked up that are third round picks? If I'm the Texans and suddenly the Chiefs go draft a guy of this caliber, that's pretty tough. Yeah, Russell Wilson, third-round pick, Steve Smith, Jason Witten, Marshall Yanda, Jamal Charles, Frank Gore, Alvin Kamara, Justin Houston. I mean, the list really just goes on and on and on. So there's third-round there's third round picks that make a real difference every single year. So if one of them happens to go to the Chiefs in your scenario, then why would the Texans want that? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense at all. They're trying to catch the Chiefs. 